Recently, turning forests to farmland campaigns have been launched throughout China, which require farmers to convert their forest and woodland into farmland. Since April, the authorities have also deployed agricultural management teams to carry out the so-called stabilizing grain production and ensuring food supply operations. They went to the fields and forcibly flattened non-grain crops planted by farmers. Previously, the authorities also announced policies such as a 10 billion yuan spring farming subsidy to promote increased grain production. Furthermore, on May the first, the newly revised military service law, which was amended in April, was officially implemented, expanding the scope of conscription. Many analysts believe that the underlying reason behind the Chinese Communist Party's series of actions may be to prepare for war, including the possibility of a Taiwan Strait war. The online videos circulating show that large numbers of trees, fruit trees, and even bamboo groves are being cut down. Even coconut trees on the mountainside are being destroyed. But despite this, it is impossible to grow crops on such rocky terrain. Some villages even have slogans like "Not a single poplar tree in the village." This pear tree in full bloom was also cut down, much to the dismay of the farmers. In Inner Mongolia, small trees that have been growing in the desert for more than ten years are also being uprooted. Farmers who have been growing vegetables for six months had their crops cleared by the agricultural management teams. In Guangxi Province, on April 26, even chili peppers are being plowed up, and only grain is allowed to be grown, prompting farmers to ask if they will only be allowed to eat rice and not vegetables in the future. In Chengdu, Sichuan, fish ponds are being filled in to create farmland. China's agricultural management teams, with the assistance of police, are removing the economic crops grown by farmers and demanding that they be replaced with grain crops. Plastic greenhouses used by farmers to grow vegetables are also being demolished. In the Shanghai suburbs, on April 28, farmers were growing grapes that were about to ripen when officials ordered them to be cleared and replaced with rice. The agricultural management strategies implemented by the Communist Party appear to lack rationality. As evidenced by their use of heavy machinery to create terrace fields on mountains, despite the absence of an irrigation source, this would inevitably lead to the failure of rice crops due to insufficient water supply. These newly developed terrace fields are also not reliable. In a heavy rain, the whole field may be washed away. Many lands that were originally suitable for planting trees are not suitable for growing crops. However, In some places, there is a one-size-fits-all approach, resulting in no crop growth and wasted destruction of forests and fruit trees. Just imagine if there were no fruits and vegetables, no chicken, duck, or fish to eat, and only grain every day. Who could stand it? The side effects of this practice will quickly emerge, such as the rising vegetable and fruit prices. It will also lead to significant problems in China's food production. In the end. The common people will be the ones who suffer, just like the Great Leap Forward movement launched by the CCP in 1958. In order to achieve the so-called overtaking Britain and catching up with the United States, the CCP called on the entire population to smelt steel. In rural areas, they also built makeshift steel furnaces in the fields and smelted steel with firewood. Many people donated metal items from their homes, such as pots, spoons. Various iron tools and even iron door handles to smelt steel. However, due to the lack of technology and the inability to reach the required temperature, only a large amount of waste iron was smelted. Not only did it waste countless precious resources, but it also caused significant environmental pollution. Due to the shortage of iron ore, the entire population did not work in the fields, but went up to the mountains to mine. Causing a large amount of mature crops to rot, as nobody was harvesting them. This was followed by three consecutive years of famine from 1959 to 
Historians concur this is a direct result of the CCP's failed and irresponsible policies. So let's take a look at whether China really lacks food. Li Hengqing, a U.S.-based economist, analyzed that China's food production in 2022 is approximately 680 million tons, while the consumption is as a high as 760 to 780 million tons. Therefore, China's food supply and consumption are indeed a bit tight, but there is no problem with global food imports. The only concern of the CCP government is that once it goes to war with Taiwan, it may face sanctions on food imports, which could cause a political crisis. This is the real ambition behind the CCP's cry of a food crisis. The emergence of agricultural management teams also reflects China's return to a planned economy and collective management mode in rural areas. Agricultural management is a comprehensive administrative law enforcement department for rural areas, which conducts safety law enforcement work on rural and agricultural activities, agricultural products, etc. It is also responsible for monitoring and managing resources such as seeds, pesticides, and soil in rural areas. The agricultural management team is the grassroots level authority in China's rural areas and acts as an agent for the central government. Therefore, it carries out the so-called Grain Supply Stability Special Action Plan according to the requirements of the superiors. Not only does it ensure that agricultural land is used to grow food, but also the types of food planted must fully meet the current national needs. In fact, these actions have very obvious planned economic characteristics. It can be said that China's agricultural production has gradually shifted from fulfilling a market economy to the current centralized economy. The purpose of this institutional transformation is very clear, which is to prepare and stimulate a wartime economy in the future. If China enters a wartime state, then the entire country's rural area will be its foundational support. Therefore, the government must ensure rural China's stability so that it can continue to provide logistic support. Otherwise, battles may be lost and the regime will topple. To cooperate with this special action of stabilizing grain and ensuring supply, the Chinese government has also provided 10 billion yuan in fiscal subsidies to farmers to encourage them to grow grain. Many local governments forcibly implemented the forest into farmland campaign and eradicated other crops and replaced them with grain in order to obtain central government subsidies. However, once the subsidies fall into the hands of local governments, how much can truly be given to farmers is up to them to decide. Therefore, the agricultural management team is not actually working for the central government to stabilize agriculture and food production without benefits, but is trying to make money and work in their own interests. They are not just executors, but a group of rent seekers. According to the transcript of a certain media outlet in mainland China, the first thing the agricultural management team did after its establishment was to charge fees. In rural areas. They calculate the fee per person per day based on household registration, which is a typical rent-seeking behavior. In addition, as we mentioned in a previous video, agricultural officials also catch chickens, kill dogs, demolish houses, and carry out various inspections and random fines in rural areas, causing blatant harassment to the locals. On April 22nd, a farmer's house in Hubei Province that was built in a European style and did not meet regulations was demolished by a team of rural officials. Additionally, due to the withdrawal of foreign investment, many Chinese enterprises have gone bankrupt, and many migrant workers who worked in big cities cannot find jobs and have to return to their hometowns. However, they are already accustomed to urban life. Do not know how to farm and cannot adapt to the monotonous rural life. Suddenly facing a loss of income and without seeing any prospects, they may take the opportunity to vent their dissatisfaction with the government. As a result, China's rural areas may accumulate terrifying political resistance. For the Chinese Communist Party, there is nothing more important than maintaining the stability of its regime. Therefore, the birth of rural officials has also taken on some of the stability maintenance work in rural areas, especially in the event of a war, where they must maintain order. 
but the result may be the opposite. After returning to their hometowns, farmers who were originally only worried about their future are now oppressed by rural officials, making it easier to incite resentment and trigger protests. Therefore, the actions of rural officials can be characterized as engaging in rent-seeking behavior and creating difficulties. Of course, this is not a situation that the Chinese government is happy to see. However, grassroots governance in China has always been an informal system, or rather, an informal institution. Ordinary Chinese citizens are aware that the forces governing them encompass not just a visible formal system, but also an underlying informal network that operates within society. It is precisely this informal system that ordinary people feel in their daily lives. Therefore, the Chinese people live under two systems and are forced to accept double exploitation. In fact, not only in rural areas. But at all levels of the Chinese Communist Party's government, there are covert rules and two coexisting systems of governance. This is why corruption and bribery are rampant in China's political circles. It is worth noting that the changes in the grassroots of China's rural areas, especially the changes in the entire social structure and regulatory system. Are also a manifestation of the Chinese Communist Party's increasingly centralized and authoritarian power. Let's take a look at the new changes that have occurred in rural China over the past two years. In 2021, the Chinese Communist Party first implemented the village chief system in rural Shandong Province, which involves grid management of rural areas. The party then began gradually implementing a rural government point system, which is similar to a digital food voucher system. The rollout of the supply and marketing cooperative system is also linked to this point system. In the future, farmers will use points to purchase goods from supply and marketing cooperatives, effectively abolishing the monetary system in rural areas. In recent years, the Chinese Communist Party has also been promoting the deployment of university graduates to support rural development, which marks the beginning of rural China becoming a tool for solving urban unemployment problems. The surplus labor force in cities is being transferred to rural areas, effectively turning them into a dumping ground for employment. The rural management team has now been officially instilled into rural areas, becoming the grassroots law enforcement and patrolling authority. The new changes in rural China demonstrates that the government is continually strengthening and centralizing its control over various rural resources. In fact, since Xi Jinping took office ten years ago, the central government has been continuously consolidating its power. Transitioning from local government to the central government, and ultimately to the president Xi Jinping, whether it is military reform or reform of the state council, public security, and judiciary, the goal is the same. The so-called anti-corruption and crackdown on capitalists are actually aimed at removing obstacles to centralizing power. Although this centralization has led to difficulties in the private economy, including the bankruptcy of private companies and the withdrawal of foreign investment, it is a price that must be paid for strengthening centralization. For the Communist Party, maintaining stability is of utmost importance. The well-being and livelihoods of ordinary people, whether they are prosperous or happy, are secondary. Centralizing power and completing the Communist Party's political mission to effectively govern China as a whole is the ultimate goal. However, in the process of centralization, the first to be exploited, oppressed, and deprived of rights are the majority of rural Chinese, who ultimately lose their livelihoods, freedom, and means of production.